As you know, if you follow the Texas Energy and Power Newsletter and the Energy Capital Podcast, there are a parade of terrible anti-energy, anti-growth bills in front of the Texas legislature. One of the worst of them had a hearing on April 14th. House Bill 3356 by Representative Jared Patterson was laid out in committee. This is a bill that would require firming of all individual generating resources. This would be a fantastically expensive way to operate a grid. The whole reason you have a grid operator like ERCOT is to actually be able to spread those costs around, to actually be able to have a system. You don't need every individual generator to have a backup because you have a system that has backups in it. But 3356 and its companion, Senate Bill 715, which on April 15th passed out of the Senate Business and Commerce Committee on a 6-4 to four vote, would do away with this long-standing precedent in the market and put the onus on every individual generator. It gets worse because there was already a policy that was going to put this kind of thing in place in 2027, but this bill actually makes it retroactive. So every investor, developer, project owner, operator who put a project in the ground with a certain set of rules in place will now have those rules completely rewritten in the middle of the competition. It's almost certainly unconstitutional. It will bog our energy system down in all sorts of lawsuits, create regulatory uncertainty, and stifle investment. So what we're going to do today is play a couple of clips from the hearing. We're also going to go back a couple of years because there was a very similar proposal in 2023 when ERCOT CEO Pablo Vegas testified and gave some really interesting information about just this kind of proposal. The first clip you're going to hear is from Representative Patterson's bill layout in committee on April 14th. Let's go to the clip. Moreover, the volatility created in the market by intermittent renewable resources and hyper-conservative purchases of ancillaries in the market has caused other components of a user's electricity bill to soar to the tune of billions of dollars annually. They estimate $2.3 billion in additional cost due to the volatility of wind and solar. I'm not sure who the they is that Representative Patterson is referring to when he says renewables cost $2.3 billion in ancillaries. What he's talking about there is this widespread but false belief that renewables drive up the cost of ancillary services. So for those of you that listen to the podcast, you'll recall that I interviewed Commissioner Jimmy Glotfelty after he left the Public Utility Commission. And I asked him what he was most proud of from his time at the PUC. He could have chosen a lot of different things he worked on, but he said the establishment of the market analysis group at the PUC was the thing he was most proud of. Well, that market analysis group in 2024 actually did a study on this very topic. They analyzed exactly how much renewables cost in terms of increased ancillary services. And you might be surprised to hear the answer. Let's listen to the Deputy Executive Director of the Public Utility Commission correcting Commissioner Glotfelty in December of 2024 after Commissioner Glotfelty suggested that renewables did cost extra in ancillary services. The other thing that I wanted to address is something that you said, Commissioner Glotfelty, about the correlation between ancillary service need and intermittent renewable resource growth. And um, the commission published a report uh, to the legislature uh, on December 1st, um, responding to some legislation that was passed in, in the last session uh, about the uh, association between ancillary services and, and dispatchable and non-dispatchable generation. And surprisingly, the data doesn't bear out in the way that you were describing. Um, and sorry to contradict you, sir. Um, but at least at this time, given the data that we have from, from ERCOT and, and from the research that we've been doing, the need for ancillary services are based on risk and not resource type. And yes, certain kinds of resources present different kinds of risks, um, but all things being equal over the course of the year, what the research that, that the market analysis team was able to produce was that there, there's no strong correlation between those two. And... Um, uh, you know, we'll continue to dig in deeper this coming year and, and see if we can't continue to find, you know, more layers of that onion to, to peel back. But, but at this moment in time, 
we're not seeing that correlation. There's no strong correlation between those two, said the PUC Deputy Executive Director, Barksdale English, after the commission had studied this issue for a year. Why did they study this issue? Because the legislature, because some of the folks who were really against renewables, slipped a provision into a bill They required the PUC to study this. The folks who are actively working against renewables were hoping that this study would show that, yes, there's this huge correlation and renewables are causing all these costs in the system to go up. But their gambit backfired because the data doesn't bear out that conclusion at all. And look, elected officials are entitled to file whatever bills they want and have whatever views they want. But if they're going to present something to their fellow members as facts, They should make sure they're facts. And the fact here is that the data does not bear out their conclusions. Renewables do not drive up the cost of ancillary services. And so if they were being true, and if they were really looking out for consumers, then they would actually look at this data and stand down from what they had done in 2023 and actually remove the forward-looking provision that renewables have backup starting in 2027. Instead, they're going the other way. They're ignoring the facts, ignoring the data, ignoring the report they directed the PUC at taxpayer expense to produce, and instead are now trying to make this provision retroactive to all units that are already on the system. One of the things that the Deputy Executive Director English said is that we don't procure ancillary services based on individual resource type. We, we procure them based on risk. The biggest risk on the system is that one of the largest plants falls offline unexpectedly. That would be a nuclear unit or a very large coal unit. But we do not assign ancillary service costs to individual nuclear units. That would be unfair and would drive up their costs. The same principle should extend to renewables. You buy ancillaries for the whole system, not for individual generating units. This kind of a bill is a mistake. It would drive up costs and it would not increase reliability. What you're going to hear now is a little clip from ERCOT CEO Pablo Vegas talking to the Senate Business and Commerce Committee two years ago when they were considering this novel concept of of firming. What they ended up doing was making a compromise to make it prospective and not retrospective. But let's listen to what ERCOT CEO Pablo Vegas told the committee about the impact that firming would have on existing generation and who would pay for it. It could create uh, it could create an energy kind of valley at the outset until the longer term intent of it uh, comes into what, play. What do you mean an energy valley? An energy meaning we would lose energy resources in the short term. So resources that cannot be economic under the new cost burden that's put in place would pull out of the market. So we would have an energy deficit from that until we would see the longer term effects of energy of new supply being built based on the revenues created from the firming costs. Right, and if these are if there are additional costs imposed, I'm I'm not sure from your testimony whether we're saying that the the generators are going to bear that cost or whether it's going to ultimately be passed on to consumers anyway. Effectively, in a, in the energy market, all of the costs flow down to consumers. The costs will flow to consumers. Did you catch that? Your bills are going to go higher if these proposals become law. That would be the impact. You would have additional generation go offline right as at the time when demand is growing significantly, putting a squeeze in the energy market, which will cause prices to go higher. And where do those prices flow to? To you, to you, the consumer. Now, a lot of times I'm asked by people, why are legislators doing this? Why would they want to hurt renewable energy and ultimately hurt the Texas economy and consumers? Now, the Texas Public Policy Foundation has been pushing this firming thing for a long time, uh, and they've got some big dollar folks behind them. But let's take Representative Patterson at face value. Let's listen to what he's saying as far as why he's doing this. And look, if you're a doctor and you're going to prescribe a cure, you better make sure you've got the diagnosis right, right? You don't want to give chemotherapy to a diabetes patient, right? You got to make sure that the cure meets the actual disease. And what he says is the problem is in fact not the problem. 
his diagnosis of what happened during Winter Storm Uri is wrong. And I'm going to show you why. But first, let's listen to him. Natural gas was overperforming by a wide margin, a wide margin leading up to and during Winter Storm Uri. Did they have some problems? Yes, but they still overperformed during that. Overperformed, said Representative Patterson. Let's take a look at this, shall we? So I'm pulling from the UT Energy Institute post Uri report and also the report of the North American Electric Reliability Corporation and Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. These were the most exhaustive studies done after Winter Storm Uri. And what you're looking at is right now is from the first of those, the UT Energy Institute. And what it shows here is that we had a reduction in gas supply, the fuel, right? Even if the power plants didn't freeze and they're in perfect condition, which they weren't, but even if they were, if they can't get fuel, they can't run. And this is what was going on in the Permian Basin specifically. Before the power ever went out, output was down 40 to 50%. Once the power went out, it dropped all the way down to 85% less than what its throughput was just one week before. This is another view of this. This is from the FERC and NERC report. Again, a 300-page report, very exhaustive in its investigation. And this shows what happens with natural gas production. Again, this was before the power went out. A lot of people said after Yuri, oh, it was only the power that went out that caused the problems in the gas fields. You can see a lot of it was out before the power ever went out. Now, this one, I think, really tells the story. What this is looking at is the, the time frame leading up to the outages. So if you'll recall, the outages during Winter Storm Uri happened at about 1.20 in the morning. You can see this black line dropping right here. You can see what wind and solar were doing the few days before and during the outages. Now look at the thermal plant outages. Do you notice anything similar here between the black line down and the red line up? Thermal plants, of course, mean coal, gas, and nuclear plants. ERCOT expected 14 gigawatts of thermal outages in its extreme planning scenario. If they got to an extreme problem, they thought they would lose 14. By Monday morning when the outages happened, they had lost 30 gigawatts. That is not an overperformance, not even close. It's a massive underperformance, and you can see the direct correlation of thermal plant outages to the rolling outages initiated by ERCOT. There's another great look at this. This is using data from ERCOT's report, their seasonal assessment of resource adequacy. And what you're looking at here is the black dashed lines show basically what they expect under regular conditions. And the red is what they would expect if things are really going poorly. This would be like an extreme weather event and in extreme situation, we would never drop below this red level line level of availability. And you can see every single resource struggled, right? Nuclear, actually one of the four units was, was lost, and that brought you right down to that red line. Wind stayed mostly above the red line, but below the black. Solar was actually the only one that actually overperformed the, basically the entire time and stayed above the red line. Coal went below the extreme levels, and gas never, during the entire period of the outage, reached even the level of outages they would expect in an extreme situation. Gas did not overperform. It drastically underperformed. It was the main cause of the winter storm Uri rolling outages, not the only cause. Renewables struggled, nuclear struggled, and demand was off the charts, which is one of the reasons we need to address energy efficiency. But again, you cannot prescribe a cure if you don't have the diagnosis right. Representative Patterson and so many others at the Capitol still fundamentally misunderstand Winter Storm Uri. And I really hope for those folks, this is, look, this isn't personal. I want everybody to get this right. It is too critical to get wrong. At least 246 people died during Winter Storm Uri. Please, policymakers, read the FERC and NERC report. It's 300 pages, well worth your time. The problem was not renewable energy. The problem was all resources, but mostly, as this very clearly shows, thermal power plant outages driven by freezing issues and a lack of fuel availability, that fuel being gas. Now look, 
gas is still an important resource, and it's going to be an important resource in ERCOT for a long time to come. But that does not mean you put all of your eggs in that basket. We have studies now that show that had we had the level of solar that we have right now, outages during winter storm URI would have been 15 to 30 percent less. For those of you that were in the state of Texas during winter storm URI, you remember on February 16th, the worst day of the outages when 85 percent of the gas was offline, it was extremely sunny. We only had about five or 6,000 megawatts of solar. We now have over 30,000. That is a good thing. That strengthens our grid. If a bill like House Bill 3356 or Senate Bill 715 or these other bills, Senate Bill 819 or 388 pass, that will slow that down. It will weaken grid reliability. There are challenges to integrating intermittent renewable resources. It's challenging but it's important that we do it. It's important we get it right. And it's important that we understand that renewables did not cause the outages during winter storm URI. If that's what's motivating anybody, please spend time and read these reports and understand what really happened during that time. Please take a minute to go and subscribe at DougLewin.com to the podcast, to the newsletter. We'll continue to cover these issues for the next six, seven weeks uh, as the session begins to wind down. Uh, it's, it's not winding down anytime soon, but it will at some point. Um, I'm already looking forward to that point. Uh, follow us there. Also find us, Doug Lewin Energy on YouTube, Doug Lewin Energy on Twitter, and also you can find me on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. Leave your comments below. We're interested to hear what you liked about this video, what you'd like to see in future ones, and have a great day.